Hey everyone, thank you so much for joining the Behind Company Lines podcast today. We have Cyrus Masumi, founder of ZocDoc and current founder and CEO of Dr. B, the new telehealth platform that is improving access to everyday prescriptions. Cyrus, thank you so much for jumping on the show. I'm really excited to chat with you, especially in the, you know, coming from the healthcare space, there's a lot of innovation that's happening. Um, I, 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 I didn't chat about this before, but I actually worked in the prescription space as a, at a local pharmacy from age of 14 to 20, um, you know, cutting my teeth in a small business. So there's so many things that fascinate me about the, you know, mechanics around getting prescriptions, the whole, you know, um, um, prescription process and, and provider network and all these things that really encompass get, getting people the help that they need. Uh, but before we start any of that, Tell me a little bit about your journey about Dr. B, ZocDoc, who got you into the healthcare space and, and starting to innovate with technology. Well, my, uh, I guess I would credit my mom with that. So at a very young age, my mother really wanted me to be a doctor. And so she would tell me that uh, the best thing about being a doctor is that you always have access to healthcare. And uh, much to her uh, and, and access to healthcare is the most important thing she would follow. And so much to her dismay, uh, I unfortunately never became a doctor, but the lesson of the importance of access to care stuck with me and it sort of followed me throughout my, my life. I remember shortly after, uh, my mom had tried to influence me to be a doctor. I learned that uh, a woman who was like a second mother to me didn't have healthcare coverage. And that meant she didn't have access to the most important thing. And I, I was so worried for her. Uh, and, I, and I remember, uh, well, I, 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 the, 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 the worry that I felt is something that 90 million Americans feel every day because there's a lot of people in this country who either have no access to care because they have no coverage or they have no access to care because they can't afford to use the coverage that they had. Yeah. So I ultimately, um, I think that the, the access problem in healthcare is probably what led me to start ZocDoc. Uh, I was on a flight flying across the country. I had a really bad sinus infection. My plane landed in New York and I ruptured an eardrum. And I needed to find an ENT doctor on short notice. And I went to my insurance company website. I started calling doctors and I was calling doctors who, whose offices were no longer operational. I called one doctor who was dead. And I'm like, why is it so hard to book a doctor's appointment? So that's what led us to start ZocDoc and expand the company over the next decade to span the entire country across 50 different medical specialties. And though we were able to improve access by enabling people to click on a, a specific uh, uh, doctor appointment time and, and click in a, and get an appointment instantly, we, I, I always thought that, that we never did enough for those people who didn't have coverage. Uh, and that was probably my biggest regret is that I didn't do enough to help uh, everyone. And so I always told myself that when I, uh, if I were to start another healthcare company, that uh, when I did, I would make sure that we're, we're treating every single person. And so uh, fast forward now, um, I left ZocDoc. I joined the board of the, the Mailman School of Public Health at Columbia. I learned a lot about uh, many public health issues, but namely uh, the inequities that, that, that are uh, rampant in our healthcare system and uh then covid breaks out and as you may recall that covid sort of shined a light in a lot of the inequities that have come about because of healthcare. yeah uh and we uh as the vaccine was being rolled out i saw an opportunity to help improve the access uh, of the vaccine for all people so what was happening was back when we, we had very limited quantities of vaccine uh, people were waiting in line all day, hoping that someone would no show or cancel on their vaccine appointment and they could get their vaccine earlier than uh, what was being uh, recommended by the local governments. And what that meant was that people who could financially or physically afford to wait in line all day were the ones that were getting those excess shots, which were about 20 to 30 percent of our entire vaccine supply back when the vaccine was the most valuable commodity on earth. And those weren't the people who were necessarily dying from COVID. So what we initially yeah. started to do with Dr. B was take that excess vaccine and reallocate it to people who needed it most, who couldn't maybe physically or financially afford to wait in line all day, but they desperately needed the shot. And so we made sure that over a million vaccines were reallocated uh, in the prioritized way. And then when the COVID vaccine became 
ever present. We had this amazing team and, and decided, let's go solve another problem of healthcare access and inequity, namely access to everyday prescriptions. So there are so many people who half of all adult Americans that struggle with some chronic illness. And if you don't have access to care, managing that chronic illness can be quite complex and expensive. And so there are many, many medications that have what's called a very high therapeutic index. They're very, um, the risks relative to the benefits, uh, uh, low risk relative to uh, high benefits. And so for those, those types of prescriptions, we wanted to make a very efficient way for every American to get access to uh, the, the treatments when they need it. And so we started with COVID antivirals. So uh, for those people who are unaware, uh, there's medication now that if you get COVID, you can get better a lot faster. Uh, Paxlovid and Milopiravir are the name of these medications. And the problem with prescribing them is that you need to get access to these medications within five days of getting COVID. So that means that someone needs to have healthcare coverage. They have to know, uh, have a primary care doctor. That primary care doctor has to have availability to see them. That person has to hope that it's not a weekend that the doctor is not going to be unavailable. And all of that has to happen within five days, which is really difficult for a lot of people to navigate. So what we decided to do is roll out a service where anyone that gets COVID can go online across 42 states and they can take a picture of their COVID test, fill out an online health assessment. And within one hour, a health practitioner will treat them. And if they qualify, they'll send the antiviral medication to the pharmacy of the patient's choosing. And we do that for $15, which is less than the average copay uh, for almost every American. And if someone can't afford $15, we actually treat them for free, making it the first telehealth service in the country that I'm aware of that treats everyone, regardless of their ability to pay. Yeah, it's, it's incredible. And I'm curious on what are the mechanics behind you know, doing such quick service in say, you know, an interview that's historically very slow, you know, there's a lot of loopholes, there's a lot of red tape to, to go through, you know, what, what are ways that, you know, is, is it your previous network from ZocDoc? Is it, you know, new partnerships? Is it going directly to the manufacturers? How are you offering such a fast service, um, in, in this space? So we're leveraging, uh, technology one, uh, to be highly efficient in everything that we do. Uh, and so we're really trying to make sure that we are the lowest cost and most efficient yeah. option for people. Uh, number two, because that's our, our positioning that we're trying to be uh, low cost and high, highly efficient, we're able to uh, have a higher volume of patients who use the platform. Mm -hmm. And that enables us to load balance to make sure that we're growing our, our provider network accordingly and that they're utilized. Uh, this is all a utilization game to make sure that the providers that are on the platform are uh, their time is, is valuable and that their time is being maximally allocated to patient care. Yeah. But if, well, speaking from the provider perspective, it, you know, what are the, the typical silos? You, you mentioned your story about needing to get a provider, you know, a healthcare professional to treat your, you know, your ruptured eardrum and your sinus infection in, yeah. in, in a short amount of time. And some people weren't even, you know, alive. What are the silos yeah. of information and, and is it from... And who, who's kind of, I don't want to say responsible, but who can be kind of an active party in, in decreasing those silos? Is it the providers or is it companies, you know, in connection with those providers? Is it, is it patients? Where does this joint information come from to kind of, you know, offer the accessibility that is out there, but maybe, you know, there, there's a disconnect by, by receiving it. So that's an interesting question. I think, I think the, um, the way our health system has been set up in the United States, it's fee for service. So you have an issue, you go to a doctor, uh, you get treated. Uh, that means that there are players in the health system that perhaps benefit from people who don't get treated uh, uh, on a short-term basis and are not necessarily incentivized to make it easy for patients to get the care that they need. Um, so... If you just look at the the business model of insurance company, uh, if they were thinking very long term and they they knew that a patient was going to be with them forever, they would have incentives to invest in preventative care and do all, and get the patient to go to the doctor. But if the average American is changing their job every couple of years, and that's where most of the commercially insured people are coming from, there really is no long term incentive. That, you know, from a policy perspective, we try to do things in this country that make 
longer term incentives uh, for, for insurance companies to, to think at a, a different time window. But really, in running their business, they have to think about the short term. And the short term, there isn't necessarily an economic incentive to get you to be a consumer of healthcare services. Yeah. So as a result, uh, uh, you know, that directory that I went on for my insurance company, I would surmise to say that there was no economic incentive mm-hmm. for whoever was in charge of that directory to make it better. Yeah, I'm, I'm sure that they, they wanted to make it better, but they probably didn't get all the resources they needed in the company to go call every doctor's office. Like, are you still operational? Are you still here? And, you know, the, uh, it, it's so cumbersome for doctors to get access to become part of an insurance panel that if they choose to stop accepting insurance, typically they're just going to stop ex- accepting it. They're not going to call the insurance company and get removed because what if they want to join later on? So now all, uh, you know, as a result that there's not an ingrained behavior and I'd say the relationship between physicians and payers is probably one of the most strained relationships of any type in this country. And so, uh, uh, you know, b- b- between that difficult relationship and the lack of an incentive to keep these directories up to date, and to, which it's the first step to how patients access care in many circumstances, that is uh, probably the reason for the silos you're talking about. Yeah. We're, we're, how have the incentives changed now? Uh, I don't think the incentives have changed necessarily. I think that there is movement in the U.S. healthcare system of moving to uh, what they call value-based care. So rather than uh, uh, a primary care provider, for example, to be compensated by every time that you consume a service, they would get a flat fee for managing your care. So now, all of a sudden, the provider is aligned to managing uh, costs on behalf of the patient, on behalf of, of the insurance company. And uh, there are many who believe that the only way that healthcare costs in America will be, uh, will be con- contained, if you would, mm-hmm. is by moving to a value-based system because it further aligns the economic interest of, of all parties. Yeah. Uh, and I think uh, uh, Kaiser Permanente, which is a, uh, you you're mentioned you're in California, this is a big health it's- system that's both a payer and a uh, healthcare provider in California. And they've managed to be very effective at, at containing their costs relative to the U.S. healthcare system as a whole. So I think there is some uh, promise in that model. The problem has been that health systems in the United States, as they try to transition, they've only transitioned partially, and it's very difficult to operate as both a fee-for-service and as a, a value-based provider at the same time, because you're operating two businesses that are kind of diametrically opposed at times. So how do you make decisions? And so there hasn't been a huge amount of success yet in the space, but many believe that's what we have to get to for American healthcare to really be under control from a cost perspective. Yeah. Outside of Kaiser, are there you know, do you do a lot more private companies? I, I was a part of um, Oscar Health, and there's like um, there's a super popular one when I was living in San Francisco, where you would pay for the overall service. You'd get access to a bunch of providers, different doctors for different services, but it'd be a flat fee, uh, which seems you know yeah. the, the value based incentive um, approach. Where is the is it the shift coming from private companies and that evolution, or or is it now moving into kind of the more you know, the larger providers like the Anthem or the Blue Crosses of the world. Um, where are we in that timeline? So the larger payers uh, like the Anthems of the world, as you mentioned, are definitely uh, doing, and, and they have, as I understand, numerous uh, pilot projects in support of different ACOs. And uh, many provider organizations across the country are also trying it out. Uh, I, you know, I'm, I'm not, uh, this is not my area of, of deep expertise to sort of, uh, pinpoint who's doing it well, who's not, uh, there definitely are pockets in the country that are working, but there are fewer of those than those that are not working. Yeah. Shifting to Dr. B and folk a little bit more on the access to prescriptions. As I mentioned, you know, I, I'm, I had a fairly, fairly intimate experience with, uh, ph- the pharmaceutical industry, you know, working from, uh, um, an independent pharmacy who also compounded and made prescriptions from scratch. So it was an interesting um, experience to see the, the differences between the providers and uh, patients' access, doctor networks, and, and how they all kind of, it, it, 
I wouldn't say it was like, um, it wasn't like a symphony, you know, it, it was like a, a battle of the bands or, or something along that nature where, where everyone was in a little bit of friction and conflict. Um, but shifting to Dr. B, how are you giving patients the access? Are you partnering with the manufacturers of, of these, these drugs? Are you, um, yeah, I, I'm just so fascinated on how you're able to allow people the access to this on what seems like a sliding scale um, in terms of payment for, for the service. Yeah, so uh, you know, $15 uh, to get treated by a medical provider seven days a week and generally an hour. That is the uh, superior service on multiple dimensions. And so one of the big, uh, uh, one of the things that we try to do at Dr. B is to keep our costs down as low as possible so we can transfer that value to the, the patient. Uh, mm -hmm. So we're not in a position where we can spend money on a Super Bowl ad or money on lots of subway ads or billboards, et cetera. We're really focusing on, on giving uh, patients a great experience uh, and hope that they will in turn refer their friends to us. And even though the company is really young and our, our telehealth service, we only publicly launched it in August, but uh, a meaningful portion of the patients that come to us are coming through word of mouth. And so I think that if people have a good experience, uh, they tend to tell their friends about it. Uh, I also think that uh, there are a number uh, of um, uh, uh, healthcare entities, public health officials, et cetera, that are sending out information about Dr. B to their constituents because it just makes sense. Yeah. Uh, everyone wants to, the pandemic to go away. And for those that get uh, COVID, uh, which was our first treatment to, to, to get that treatment uh, simply and conveniently and inexpensively. Um, and I, I think that, uh, as we, as I mentioned before, we're not just staying with, with COVID antivirals. Uh, we, before the end of the year, we'll have 15 new treatments on the platform across four different medical specialties. And we'll be adding uh, more treatments and more specialties, uh, all the time. Uh, so, you know, I, I think, uh, uh, uh key uh key for us and it's, it's one of the the things that we are um hyper focused on is is how do we build a big business without having to pour hundreds of millions of dollars into marketing yeah yeah it's it's fascinating that you discussed the the word of mouth concept i, I was talking to another founder and we were discussing the different you know go-to-market strategies you know a lot of people um you know use whether it's market emails or you talk about paid advertising um, but the word of mouth can be so effective in just doing good work and, and having that and kind of network effect spread amongst the different um, users that that join your platform. What have you seen so far in terms of user growth since you've launched in August? I'm assuming you, know, you had a really strong core of individuals using your service, had a really great experience. You said a lot of the new users are are just from word of mouth. What have you seen in terms of growth on your platform? Uh, you know, it's, it's been, uh, very strong, uh, so much so that we've had to grow our provider network by a factor of 10, uh, in the last three months. Uh, so we, uh, we're definitely, um, uh, keeping up the demand, but it's, it's, uh, uh, it's requiring us to work at a pretty fast clip. And, yeah. you know, that, that is, um, been in absence uh, the COVID wave. Thankfully, the last three months, COVID has been uh, manageable in this country. We haven't seen a spike. Yeah. Uh, unfortunately, many folks expect because fewer Americans are boosted, I think less than 10% of the U.S. population is boosted at this point. So it's at a, you know, a, we were uh, several, iter several times higher than that when we did the first wave of, of yeah. vaccine. So as a result, uh, should a, uh, God forbid, another wave arrive here, uh, which public health people predict may happen around the Thanksgiving time frame, yeah. uh, you know, I think being able to sort of keep up with that will be very, um, very critical for us because people are going to start depending on the service, seeing as a lot of Americans haven't been vaccinated. Yeah. Which by oh, the way, we... oh, go ahead. If I can make a plug, I just think it's, uh, you know, the, the new vaccines uh, are obviously incredibly important for uh, for us as a, from a public health perspective. And, and hopefully those listening, I was just saying that being, uh, being vaccinated 
uh, is incredibly important, not just for ourselves and our families, but from a public health standpoint, is part of what yeah. keeps uh, will keep America safe and keep the pandemic uh, to become a, an afterthought. So please yeah. get vaccinated if you have not been already. Absolutely. Um, what, uh, what are ways you, you mentioned moving fast and, and quick, um, what are ways that you've structurally within your team have been able to do so? Is it, you know, is it some sort of, you know, agile strategy that you're implementing based on your previous experience just from a management standpoint, how are you able to move so quickly, um, with the demand growing and having been a, being able to actually 10 X your provider network, which isn't a small feat. Um, you know, it, it's, it, especially in a rapidly changing environment that is so dependent on the. Um, you know, kind of the, the, uh, I don't want to say impulse, but the, the increase in cases and, uh, people needing help. So, uh, when I was running ZocDoc, I had a formula, uh, for success. And that formula was, uh, there are four things, great people, hard work, focus, and time. And if you had these four components, I thought you could pretty much conquer anything that you would want. And over time, what I realized and learned was that hard work actually is only temporary. What makes hard work permanent is if your purpose aligned to what you're solving. Mm -hmm. And so uh, my new formula for success is great people, purpose alignment, focus, and time. And I don't have anyone on my team who doesn't care deeply about the mission of making uh, healthcare uh, yeah. more uh, uh, um, efficient and equitable. And as a result of that, uh, it's amazing what people will achieve if they're working on something they deem to be among the most important things in this world. Yeah. And so I have an amazing team that cares very deeply about the patient. We have a huge amount of patient empathy in our company. And I think that's part of, um, that's part of what's made us successful and will help us continue to be successful. Yeah. What are some of the biggest challenges that Dr. B faces today? Well, we already talked about making sure that we can build a big brand without having to spend uh, huge amounts of money in marketing. Um, I would talk about another one, which is uh, a, a cultural uh, cultural one, which is, uh, you know, at, at ZocDoc, when I was running the company, we won all sorts of best place to work awards. Uh, we were named the number one best place to work in all of New York in like 2011 or 12, I think. And uh, I really uh the, there's a whole uh a statement in business that uh tactics beat strategy and uh i very much believe that culture beats tactics or culture is everything yeah and because we were started during the pandemic as with many companies we are remote uh remote first and uh uh how do we um uh, how do we maintain and build a super strong culture as we scale up our business being, being remote? And, uh, that is something in my mind that I've never, never done before. If I was doing it in an office, it would kind of be, uh, relatively uh, straightforward because I've, I've done it before. Yeah. Uh, but this is sort of a new challenge that I'm, uh, really want to make sure we get right is because if we don't succeed and have a strong culture, we won't be able to do what we're doing at several orders of magnitude bigger than what we are today. Yeah. If everything goes right, what is the long-term vision for Dr. B? My vision for our company is I believe that everyone in this country should have access to healthcare full stop. I think it's a basic human right. Now, how the U.S. healthcare system has evolved and how uh, divided our political system is, there is a very low probability that from a public uh, policy perspective, meaning mm -hmm. our, our federal government will be able to provide such services. So I think it's incumbent upon private sector companies to figure out a way to help yeah. bridge the gap, to make sure that every American has access to care and that it's not the number one thing that bankrupts Americans, which it is today. So in order for that to be true, I think we need to be able to navigate and help patients simply navigate through the healthcare system such that they're directed to the modality of care that is the most cost-effective and efficient for what the patient needs. So if you need a prescription refilled, you go down one path. If you have a specific uh, you know, unknown condition, you go down a different path. If you, you know, need to get a, a complicated surgery, you go down a different path. And, and how do you make sure, though, that, that we're not using the most expensive resource for the most simple thing? That's one of the easiest ways, I think, to, to maintain 
uh, maintain costs. And so I think that I'd like to play a part long term in, in that vision of making sure that every American receives care and that they have the most efficient method possible to treat them. Yeah, that's fantastic. Yeah, I would like to ask this of, of not only for selfish research, but also for my audience as well. What books of people, whether it was early in your career or even now, have influenced you the most? So I'll talk about three. Um, there, I talked about purpose alignment. Uh, I think Simon Sinek's Start With Why is just an amazing book about the power of purpose alignment in organizations and having a message to your employees, to your, your users. Uh, and so I would give that uh, book a plug. It's definitely influenced me. Uh, on the healthcare side, Robert Pearl, who was the CEO, former CEO of Kaiser, uh, wrote uh, a book called Mistreated that talks a little bit about a lot about how the problems in America healthcare, specifically what, I, what I, um, I've gleaned from the, that book was just how, you know, the cost is such a huge problem in healthcare. And what are the ways yeah. you have to actually curb that cost from occurring? We, we talked a lot about inflation. You hear about it. Uh, nowadays, as much as you heard about COVID a year and a half ago. Uh, but one of the things that people forget is that for the last 40 years, uh, healthcare costs have been increasing sig significantly faster than the economy as a whole. There's been massive inflation in healthcare. And uh, I think that, uh, um, that it's, a, it's a great book that, that every, everyone should reach, really understand why we're in the situation we're in and what possible yeah. solutions are. And I think lastly, uh, a book I'm reading now, uh, which is uh, written by uh, Ken Siegel, it's called uh, um, Insanely Simple. And there's lots of books that are written about Steve Jobs and Apple, but this book is the, the only one I've read that takes the lens of simplicity as one of Al Apple's core value propositions and talks about how they were able to infuse simplicity yeah in their product. And it wasn't just is someone in a product meeting being like, this is how we're going to do things. It was pretty much ingrained in every aspect of Apple's culture. Man. So I, I had to finish it in total, but uh, I really am fascinated by it. And it's uh, inspired me to continue to push for simple and simpler solutions for patients because in healthcare, as you mentioned from your own experience, uh, battle of the bands versus some <laughs> elegant symphony. Uh, it needs to be an elegant symphony, and that requires a huge whacking of uh, from the, the Steve Jobs metaphorical simplicity stick that that uh, is talked yeah. about in the book. Yeah, amazing. And and last little bit, I I appreciate you spending time on the show. I, I know you got to run, but um, where can we find you? Where can we support Doctor B? What it's the LinkedIn's the the website? Uh, give us all your plugs so we can be a part of or even receive care from Doctor B. Yeah. So I would direct everyone to uh, hidrb.com, H-I-D-R-B.com. Uh, hopefully you and your family or loved ones do not need access to COVID antivirals, but if you do, uh, we can go and, and, and walk you through those treatments and we'll be offering and releasing treatments uh, continuously every week, every month. So for people who are sufferers of chronic conditions, uh, we may be able to help you uh, get access to critical medications when you need them. Amazing. Well, thank you so much, Cyrus, for being on the show. I hope you enjoyed yourself, and I hope to maybe thin this episode at, at a later time, but I really appreciate your time, and, and thank you again for being on the show. Very nice to meet you. Thank you for having me. Of course.